Good morning, everybody, and Hazak Baruch. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday morning as we are studying together Perashat Beha'alot Echa. Today's class has been sponsored anonymously for the Refuah Shalema of all Am Israel. Hashem should bless our anonymous sponsor as well with all the blessings of the Torah. Amen. If anybody would like to sponsor a class, please email us info at ejsny.org. Rabotai, we are studying Perashat Beha'alot Echa. Our Perashat is loaded and there's a lot to speak about. And today I would like to speak about the episode all the way at the end, okay? And basically what happens is, we find in our perasha a lot of what Jews do best, complain, okay? We find, we find a lot of complaining in our perasha. If I wasn't Jewish, I would be an anti-Semite for saying that, but um, you're allowed to make fun of yourself. They're like some rabbi jokes that I'm allowed to say because I'm a rabbi, you know? Um, my favorite rabbi joke. Okay, I'm going to share with you a joke today. <laughs> You're in luck, everybody. I'm going to give you a joke today. It was once upon a time. This has nothing to do with my class, by the way. Okay? But uh, we could all use a good laugh once in a while. Anyways, one day, a priest walks into a barber shop. The barber gives him a haircut. He's finished. He pulls out his wallet to pay. And the barber says, no, 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 no. Chas v'shalom, God forbid. I never take money from you. You're a man of God. Your uh, priest, please, this one's on me. The priest says, wow, thank you so much. The next morning, the barber comes into the shop. And as he walks down the block, he comes to the store. He sees right in front of the door, there are 10 silver coins lined up in front of the store. The barber realizes it's from the priest. He's very appreciative. A few weeks later, a sheik walks into the store, gets a haircut. He pulls out his wallet, his credit card. The, the barber says, no, 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 this one's on me, please, really, I can't, uh, I can't take money from you, you're a man of Allah, etc. Okay, uh, the, the sheik thanks him, he leaves, the next day he comes, the barber sees in front of the store, lined up, 10 uh, dollar bills, boom, 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 10 bills of money. Wow, thank you so much, he's so appreciative. Anyways, a few weeks later, in comes a rabbi, and the rabbi sitting, he gets a haircut, after he's done, he pulls out his wallet, he gives him the credit card, and the, the barber says, no, please, you're a man of God, you're a man of faith, you preach, you're, you're a man of inspiration, I will never take money from you. The rabbi says, wow, that's so kind of you, thank you so, so much. He thanks the barber, he leaves. The next morning, the barber comes, and he sees lined right in front of his store are 10 rabbis. <laughs> okay, so that's my, uh, that's my rabbi joke. Um, I hope you I hope you like it. I hope you appreciate it. But either way, no one could say that joke unless you're also a rabbi, or else you would be a um, an anti rabbi. But either way, the uh, the perasha tells us about how the Jews complain a lot. Okay, a lot, a lot of complaining going on in our perasha, and Moshe Rabbeinu was fed up. Okay, by the way, this is not forty years. You know, sometimes people make the mistake and say, "Oh, it's forty years of complaint." This is year one, okay? He's fed up. That's how much we complained. He says, God, did I give birth to them? Did I, did I ask for this? Did I do this? Da -da 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 -da. He gives God the whole speech. And God says, okay, you know what? It's time for you to get help. And um, go get yourself 70 elders. This is where the 70 elders begins. Go get 70 Zekinim. He goes out, he finds 70 elders. Now, the way he picked the 70 elders, just interesting, there's 12 tribes. Do the math. 12 times 6 is 72. So you're going to get 6 leaders from each tribe, but that's going to give you 72. You only are allowed to have 70. So what, how are you going to do them? How are you going to, how, who's going to make the cut and who's not? So what God did was, they did a, um, a lottery. They put 70 pieces of paper with, you know, that were picked. And two were just, you know, empty. And then the 72 came in. They picked a piece of paper. And whoever wasn't, whoever didn't get the pieces were, they, you know, I'm sorry. But you are the weakest link. Goodbye. And they left. Who are these two that didn't make the cut? Now, by the way, even though they didn't make the cut, the huge, huge rabbis, the fact that they, they're the top 72 in the whole nation. It's not a small accomplishment. These two people were Eldad Umeidad. Okay? Eldad Umeidad 
they got they were the ones that didn't make the cup. And the story is over here at the end of our parasha. Take a look at what happens. The Pasuk says that Miriam and Aharon start speaking Lashon Hara about Moshe. Okay? And we learn a lot of laws of Lashon Hara, of gossip from Miriam. But she ends up speaking gossip against Moshe. She speaks negatively about his brother. And what exactly she said, it's not so clear. The Pasuk says, Al odot ha'isha ha'kushit asher lakach. Okay? She spoke about the Kushit woman that Moshe married. Who did Moshe marry? Moshe married, what was her name? Anyone know? Very good. Tzipora. So they started speaking about Tzipora. Now, what do you have against Tzipora? What do you got against Moshe's wife? So here's, here's what's going on. Um, Miriam Haita, I'm reading to you Rashi. Listen well. Miriam Haita Betzad Tzipora. Miriam and Tipora, sister-in-laws, like, you know, good, two old good sister-in-laws hanging out, chilling. And they were hanging out. When, when Moshe heard, Remember the two that didn't make the cup? Well, our parashah tells us that they still started receiving prophecy. They started receiving prophecy in Nevu'ah, even though they didn't make the cup. Now, Moshe finds out, because what were they saying in their prophecy? Anyone know what they were saying? Part of the prophecy was very scary news for Moshe, actually. The words coming out of the mouths when they were in this moment of prophetic vision, Moshe met Yehoshua Machnis. Moshe is going to die. Yehoshua is going to bring in. That's, that's freaky. Because first of all, the spies weren't sent. There's no reason Moshe should not enter. And they're now saying this very scary news. Yehoshua heard the news. And being, being the true humble person that he was, you know, if he wasn't humble, he'd be like, yes! Woo! Thank you, God! You know? Finally, Moses is going to die. I'm going to take over. Yehoshua did no such thing. He was a true student. He heard this news. He was very sad. He quickly ran to Moshe and he said, Moshe, you heard what Eldad and Medad are saying? They're saying that you're going to die and I'm going to bring them in. Kill them! And Moshe was actually very happy. He said, Halevai, everyone should be the leader. Don't worry about, don't worry about me, uh, Yoshua. Don't worry about my honor. Me yiten et kol amashem. Moshe responds back and he says in chapter 11, Pasuk 29, Mi yiten kol amashem, would that the entire people of Hashem could be prophets. I wish everybody would be on their level and say prophecy and I don't need to be a leader. You know, often we think being a leader is a good thing. And it's a thing that we should envy. And the Gemara says it already. The Gemara says, one time the rabbi, he, he appointed two of his students as head, heads of a community. He said, you think I'm giving you positions of authority? I'm giving you uh, shackles. This is a burden to be a leader. Why? When you're a leader, anyone that's a leader knows this. Whether you're a leader because you're a rabbi or you're a leader in virtue of being the president of an organization or you're the leader of a home, it doesn't matter. What happens when you're the leader? When you get picked to be a position of authority, you get zero, you get zero um, congratulations, you get zero compliments, and all you get are complaints. All day long, everyone in the synagogue is complaining. Why is the thing like this? Why is it not being done that way, right? Everyone, all day long, they're just complaining, 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 nonstop. It's not a fun thing to be a leader. Moshe Rabbeinu is like, okay, how great. Um, this is in chapter 11, verse 29, okay? Verse 29, Moshe says, I don't need to be the leader. Let them all be leaders and I'm, I'm fine to retire. I'll be more than happy to, to hand this over to somebody else. Okay, you, you know, it, leadership, it ages you, it makes you stressed, all of the above. Okay, fine. So anyways, who is standing there listening to Eldad Umedad that they just became prophets? Miriam and Tipora. Tipora hears this. So she says and she remarks to Miriam, her sister-in-law, Oi, Lineshotehen, woe to their wives. 
of Eldad Umedad. Imhem Niskakim Levua. Woe to them if they're going to be prophets. Sheyihiu Porshim Neshotehen. Now they're going to need to separate for their wives. I feel so bad for Eldad Umedad's wives. Now they need to separate from their husbands because they're prophets. That's what Tsipora remarked. Why did she say that? Because as far as she's concerned, every prophet has to separate from his spouse, from his wife. After all, Tsipora separating from Moshe. They're married for, for all this time and for a year already since Moshe got prophecy and he spoke to God. She wasn't with her husband intimately. And she assumed it was like that with every prophet. So when she hears that these two guys, Eldad and Medad, got prophecy, she says, oh boy, <laughs> good luck to their husbands, good luck to their wives. Now, Miriam is there. She has no idea what Tzipor is talking about. She's like, what do you mean? Why can't you be intimate? I'm a Neviah, I'm a prophetess, and I'm with my husband. What's the big deal? I don't understand. Tzipor, what are you talking about? And Tzipor is like, well, what do you mean? I'm not with Moshe. And Miriam says to Aharon, I don't understand. Why did Moshe separate? We don't separate. We are, you know, prophets. And God right here already, Miriam is guilty of Lashon Hara by lowering Moses' level and equating him and his level with her and her level of prophecy. And so God calls her out and he says, you think you're on Moshe's level? You're, you're pulling him down to your level saying how you're, you're the same as him? No way. And therefore you're punished for seven days. She couldn't move. She had to be excommunicated. She got leprosy. She got sara'at. And by the way, the Jewish people waited for her. They didn't travel. Which was a big honor for her. Because to have to travel alone outside of the camp is very degrading. And it's very uncomfortable. They didn't have, she didn't have the protection of the clouds. But God said, the people said, we appreciate a moment in your life that you waited. When did Miriam wait in her life? For whom did she wait in her life? When Moshe was a little baby and he was placed in the basket, who was the one that was looking? Who was the one that was following? Miriam, Miriam stood there watching what happened with this little baby Moses. And eventually what happened? He was taken by Batya, the daughter of Paro. No, no, um, no one was able to nurse Moshe successfully because he wouldn't dare drink from a non-Jew. He quickly, Miriam quickly ran and says to Batya, would you like me to find you a nurse for this man? Batya said, sure. She sent security guards. She sent the baby with his own sister, not knowing it was his sister. And who does Miriam bring the baby to? Her mom. And there's guards standing outside the house making sure nobody touches the baby. <laughs> so Paro's own decree to kill the babies, look how God's sense of humor. He ends up having, God has it that his own security men are protecting the baby that he ordered to kill. Unbelievable. And they're standing there, they're protecting the baby, they're protecting uh, uh, Yocheved, she's nursing him, until finally he grows up, he's a, he's a toddler, he's brought back, um, he's brought back to Patia. But the point is, says Tosfot, Miriam stood there watching the baby, for how long? How long do you think she was watching her brother through the little, the little uh, pond, lake, whatever? Small river. A few minutes? 15 minutes, do the math. How many minutes are there in seven days? That's how much time Hashem rewards for a good deed. 15 minutes of a mitzvah, and she got many, many times that. The seven days just for one good deed. Unbelievable. Unbelievable what's going on. 700 times maybe more. Right? That's, that's the power of one mitzvah that we do. We should never belittle the mitzvot. Okay, anyways, God calls them out and he says, don't you dare speak about Moshe like that because his level of nevuah is, surpasses any other prophet. And that's true, by the way. We need to know, no prophet will ever reach Moshe's level. Moshe spoke to Hashem 
whenever he wanted. Moshe spoke to Hashem awake. Moshe saw the prophecy clearly. Other prophets were sleeping. It wasn't on demand. They had to get chosen for God to speak to them. They also got it in riddles. They had to decode it. There are a few differences that Ambam lists between Moshe. And by the way, we mentioned this in the past a few times. Take a look. Take a look. At the end of the prayer, there are a few different things that a person should say. One of them is the Ten Remembrances. Ten things that we should remember daily. By the way, one of the ten things we should remember daily. Zachor, remember what Hashem did to Miriam. Remember what Hashem did to Miriam. That she spoke, Lashon Hara. Right? That we're supposed to remember every day how careful we should be about gossip. Because Miriam, who was a tzaddiket and only loved her brother and didn't mean any harm and protected him and was older than him. And still she gets punished for her gossip. How careful we have to be. And by the way, not only that, but every day when we say Shema, you ready for this? I'm going to share with you a little gem over here. Every day when we say Shema, before the Shema there's a paragraph called Ahavat Olam or Ashkenazim Ahava Rabbah. And we say, God, please gather us from the four corners of the world and remove the yoke. Look how pertinent, look how, oh my gosh. Remove the yoke of the Goyim from our necks. And and please bring us to your land, to our land, because you are a man who does wonders, salvation. And you chose us from every nation. When we say those words, we have to have in mind like we're standing at Har Sinai. God chose us from every nation. We were the chosen people. We have a mission. We have a mission to give over that value system to the entire world. Ubanu Bacharta, we were chosen. We have to have in mind Har Sinai. The Pasu continues, the, the, the prayers continue. Vekeravtanu Malkenu Leshimcha Hagadol. And also, you brought us close to your big and significant name. When you say those words, what should you have in mind? Leshimcha Hagadol, to your great name, the name that Amalek tried to reduce. Have in mind, never forget Amalek. So, so far, we're remembering Har Sinai. We're remembering Amalek. You ready now? Lehodot Lach, to praise you. And we have supposed to have in mind when we say those words. The Maase of Miriam. Miriam used her mouth to speak negative. And again, it sounds like she did the worst thing. She didn't do the worst thing. She did something very small. Not a big deal what she did. And still the Torah is focusing on it. Remember what she did. You're supposed to use your mouth to praise. Lehodot lach. Not to put down. So anyways, we're supposed to remember every day. Miriam. That's one of the ten things. Okay? Again, I urge everybody to read this at the end of the prayers every day. We're supposed to remember the Exodus. We're supposed to remember Shabbat. The man. Man. That's the Parnasa. God gives Parnasa. The Maasev Amalek. The Ma'amad Har Sinai, the fact that we stood at Har Sinai, okay? The fact where we angered Hashem with the Egel. What Balak tried to do with Bil'am to curse us. Miriam, remember that God gives us the strength to succeed and to remember Jerusalem. These are the 10 things that we should remember every day. It's beautiful. And then, right before, there are 13 principles of faith that we should remind ourselves of every single day. One of these 13 and by the way, if you, if you doubt any one of these 13, it makes the person a uh, kofer, an apikores, one of the worst, lowest levels of it any Jew could ever reach. Okay? They lose immediately their portion in the world to come, etc. So these are 13 things. And again, if we question them because we don't know, we want to understand, that's fine. The point is that we concluded these, these 12 are... These 13, excuse me, oh boy, 13, I promise, I believe in 13, okay. These 13 are not true. Any one of them. If I deny any one of them, it's a big problem. Okay. One of the 13 is that Moshe Rabbeinu is the Adon Lechol HaNevi'im. He is the chief of all prophets. Now, Miriam here is clearly violating that. She's clearly equating her level of prophecy with Moshe's level. So she's denying one of the 13. 
So God's angry at her for gossip, where he should be angry at her for denying one of the 13 attributes of our tenets of our faith. What happened? Why is God not, not throwing the book at her for one of these 13? Very interesting question. And the answer, Rabbi Al-Khanan Wasserman, says Rabbi Bernstein says, sorry, Rabbi Bernstein brings Rabbi Al-Khanan Wasserman, <clears throat> he says that how do we know that Moshe's level of prophecy is greater than everyone else? We know it from this story of Miriam. This is the lesson. Right after she says, God calls her out, he calls Aharon and he calls Miriam, the three people that are involved, Moshe, Miriam, Aharon. And he says to him, look at this, Hey, the three of you come out. They all come out to the oil mode, to the tent. They're standing in front of the tent of meeting. And God comes down in a cloud. And he says to Aharon and Miriam, come out. So they come out. God says, hear now my words. I mean, this is very scary if you think about it. God says to Miriam and Aharon, come out. He, sing, he, he, he singles them out. They walk. They step out of line. You know, like in the army. And then, the, and then the, the lieutenant or whoever he calls you out, you know something's up. You know like you're in trouble. Anyways, God says to them, If there shall be prophets among you, in a vision shall I make myself known to him. In a dream shall I speak with him. Not so, my servant Moses. You guys, if, if there are prophets amongst you, I come to you in a, in a dream. I come to you <clears throat> in a vision. Not so Moses. Bechol beti in, in my entire house, he is the trusted one. Pe el pe adaberbo. Mouth to mouth do I speak to him. Umar e velo bechidot. Clear vision. Not in riddles. Utmunat Hashem yabit. At the image of God does he gaze. Madua lo yerete medaber be'avim Moshe. Why did you not fear to speak about my servant? My Moses. This is how we know that Moshe's level of prophecy surpasses any other prophet. So Miriam is the only person in the world that was ever guilty of speaking negatively about Moshe without ever also being guilty of one of the 13 tenets of faith. But after this pasuk and on forever, if anyone equates his level, you're violating worse than gossip. You're violating one of the 13 ikarim. Okay, one of the 13 principles of our faith. Again, the 13 principles is something that there are already many books written on, essays, etc. It's worth studying every single one of them. I mean, there are so many things that we need to study in, in these classes together that we just simply do not have the time for. If we were to sit down and study Baruch Hashem, the Torah is endless. But just again, um, <clears throat> this is the point that is clarified over here between God and Miriam and Aaron. And again, we learn over here how careful we have to be with gossip, not to speak negatively. The Rambam, we quoted this back when we learned about gossip in Perashat Metzorah, Tazriya Metzorah. The Rambam, at the end of the laws, he says, if this is the punishment for Miriam, who loves Moses and who's older than him and saved his life and only cared about him and didn't mean any harm, this is her punishment. How careful we have to be not to speak negatively about people. There are many people that say, Rabbi, I'm not a person that likes to speak gossip. Rabbi, I don't talk about people. But, and then they'll go on and speak about people, right? <laughs> That's obviously, you know, you can't just, um, no offense, but, you know, it doesn't really uh, work all the time. There is one, just one last point I'd like to discuss today on this Pasuk of Eden, where God says to them, you think you're like Moshe? How could you not fear speaking be'avdi be'moshe? About my servant, about Moses. Now, Rashi right away says, and he notices the double be'avdi be'moshe. That seems a little bit repetitive. It's the same person. God could have just said be'avdi. Or he could have just said be'moshe. The point would have been taken. Rashi says, what does it mean be'avdi be'moshe? Take a look. 
Eno mo omer be'avdi Moshe. He doesn't say be'avdi Moshe with my servant Moses. That would have been correct if he just said, if God just said to them, why would you speak like that about my servant Moses? That would have been great. Doesn't say that. What does he say? Ela <clears throat> be'avdi be Moshe. Sounds like he's talking about two separate people. How could you speak about my servant, about Moses? Sounds like it's two separate people. Says Rashi, be'avdi. Because in a way, God is. How could you speak against my servant? Even if he wasn't Moses, how could you speak against him? Just the fact that he's a servant alone is enough to punish you. And be Moshe. Even if he's Moshe alone, it would be enough to punish you. Even if he's not my servant. Either one alone would have been bad. If you spoke about Avdi, that would have been wrong. If you spoke about Moshe, that would have been wrong. Especially that they're both the same person. He's Moshe and he's Avdi. Now, the question that everybody asks, whoa, time out. If he's Evid, if he's your servant, I get it, why I should respect him. Even if his name is not Moshe. But if he's Moshe, and he's not your servant, why should that be a reason to fear him? Am I supposed to fear every Moshe on the street now? The fact that he's Moshe alone means zero. Rashi says, if he was Moshe, even if he's not my servant, you should have feared him. Why? Why should I fear a guy whose name is Moshe? If he's not your servant, that means he's not righteous, then they shouldn't fear him. We don't give, we don't give uh, respect to people's names. We give respect to people's character. So if he's your Evid, then yes, I should fear him. But just being Moses alone means nothing. A question? Interesting question? Makes sense, the question? Meaning it sounds like, again, God seems to be giving um, significance and credence to Moshe's name itself. He says, if he was just Evid, that would be enough to fear him. If he was just Moshe, that would also be enough to fear him. Why? Why should I fear a guy just because he's Moshe? <clears throat> the answer is <clears throat> very, very interesting. There is a story in the Gemara Masechet Berachot. Gemara tells us that there was a big rabbi. You for sure heard of him. His name was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Yes? Raise your hand if you heard of him. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Okay. Big rabbi, he made a lot of takanot that we have today, a lot of laws. Maybe one of the greatest rabbis in the Gemara. The Gemara tells us, but he was, by the way, he was a student of Hillel. Okay? He was one of the students of Hillel, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Many of the institutions that we have today are because of him. You could say he's one of the greatest. Um, his, the impressions that he made really impact our lives today most. Maybe, maybe. Either way, one day his son was sick. So he quickly, what do you do with someone sick? You pray, right? He didn't pray himself. He actually sent a letter to his colleague, Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. And he said to him, could you please pray for my son's refu'ah shilema? Okay. So Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa quickly put his head in between his legs. And he thought he got into this very deep focus. He started praying and meditating and praying and meditating. And finally, he woke up and he said, the kid is better. They said, what? They quickly ran. They saw the kid, came out of his coma, completely healed. They said, wow, Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, what a miracle worker, what a wonder maker. And the rabbi, the father of the boy, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, he comments and he says, you should know, it's not because he's greater than me. It's not what it is. Actually, I'm maybe greater than him in Torah. But when it comes to God, I'm like a sad, I'm like a, I'm like a chief, I'm like a, a person of authority, and he's like an evid. A sar, if you're like a, a, a duke, right? You, you can't just come in whenever you want to the king's palace, even though you're very important. Even though you're more important than a servant. You can't just walk in wherever you want. Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, he's a servant. He is 
uh, maybe not as great as a Tsar, as a chief or as a duke or, or prince, but a servant, there is one advantage. You could come in whenever you like. Him, he's like a servant. And so he goes in whenever he wants, he prays whenever he wants. And the way Rabbi Bernstein explains this Gemara is very, very powerful. There are two types of uh, relationships that we have when it comes to mitzvot and God. There's Torah learning and there's prayer. And each one is unique and each one has its own role. Torah is Torah and we need it to know mitzvot, to know how to live, to know what to do, to know how to conduct ourselves. And then there's prayer. And the two are very different. When a person, by the way, what's greater? What's greater, Torah or prayer? So it's a trick question a little bit. Because in the one hand, our rabbis say, Talmud Torah keneget kulam. That there is nothing more important than Torah learning. However, however, you ready? I'll tell you something very, very important. Big novelty. Nothing greater than Torah in the next world. But if you want something in this world, there's only one way to get it. Prayer. You're learning Torah right now. All of a sudden, God forbid, we get, uh, we get news that something very scary just happened. Instead of learning, we should close the Zoom. We should say Tehillim together. We should pray. Because learning is great. But to get results, to get something beneficial in this world, you're looking for a Shiduch. You're looking for children. You're looking for Parnassah. More than, lear more than learning can accomplish for it. And again, I'm not belittling learning. But I'm actually trying to just... Uh, put in perspective what, what prayer could accomplish. To get something from God down here, prayer is the most powerful thing. Does that mean prayer is greater than Torah? 100% not. Talmud Torah ke kulam. Torah is greater than everything. But to get something that's going to help us, if we need assistance from God, prayer is the avenue. And so says Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, I'm like a sar. I'm like a general. I'm like a chief. I'm like a duke. I'm like a prince. However you want to translate sar. Okay? And um, at the end of the day, that's, that's the greatest thing. To the king, that's the second. I'm the greatest. And that's what I do. I learn Torah all day long. But, but when you need a favor from the king, who's the best guy to send in is not the sar. Two, you send in the servant. The servant represents the avenue of Torah, uh, excuse me, of tefillah, of prayer. And really, you see it a little bit, I don't want to say this exclusively, but you find it very big with the Hasidim versus the Mitnagdim. The Hasidim, when the Hasidut movement started a couple hundred years ago with the Baal Shem Tov, they focused tremendously on character, on prayer, on relationship with Hashem. Whereas till then, the traditional understanding was that the way to connect to Hashem was through learning. And there's nothing greater than learning. Matter of fact, when the Hasidut movement started, many rabbis were against it, including the Gaon of Vilna. The Gaon of Vilna fought out against them. It's the worst thing for Judaism. It's going to threaten and ruin and destroy everything about Judaism because the Hasidim... They took away some of the emphasis from Torah and instead they put it on prayer. You could, you could serve God in other ways, not Torah only. You could also pray. You could also do mitzvot. You could also do chez. That's what they focused on. Until then it was, what do you mean? Torah is the most important thing. Now, of course, make no mistake about it. The Gaon Mavilna's Torah and his prayer was impeccable. The Baal Shem Tov's Torah and prayer was impeccable. The point was just, you know, if a person maybe is not cut out for learning, a person is not able to learn all day, could they reach Hashem in other ways? Or do they need to be subservient to those that learn Torah? And the Hasidut came and taught that there are other ways to reach Hashem. And um, in a way, you could say that the, the avenue of Torah, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, was, was more of the mitnagdim, the ones that went against Hasidut. And the Hasidim were the ones that came and they put a lot of emphasis and they highlighted tremendously the other avenue, the avenue of prayer. And again, both are needed by every single Jew. Everyone needs to do both. Learn and pray. But the point was that even Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai realized 
that if I need something from Hashem, I'm not the best guy for this. And instead, who did he ask to pray? He asked Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. Who was Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa? Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa was not a scholar in the, as far as halakha is concerned. We don't have any halakhot from him. What do we know about him? When you think of Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, you think of more of a, a person of miracles. Of course, he learned Torah all day long. Don't misunderstand me for a second. He learned Torah 24-7. That's the only way that he was able to do so many miracles. The point is that we don't find halachot from him. His specialty was not in the avenue of halacha. It was more in the avenue of musar, of, of prayer. And so when Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai needs someone to pray for his son, who does he send? He doesn't go himself to pray. He sends Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa. Could you pray for my son? You are a servant. You focus on that relationship of a servant. You're, you'll be able to have much easier access. You need tickets to a basketball game. Doesn't matter how rich you are. You need that guy who makes $10 an hour, but he's there in the ticket, uh, you know, in the ticket studio. He's the one that could get you tickets better, even though he's nowhere near as rich as, uh, as a mogul out there. But when you need tickets, you got to know who, which guy to go to. Lehavdil. When you need something from Hashem, you go to the person whose specialty is avoda, is service, is prayer. And that's exactly what Rabbi Chayna. So going back to Moshe, Moshe excelled in both avenues. On the one hand, he was Be'avdi. He was God's Eved, God's servant. But on the other hand, he was also Moshe. He was also the genius of Torah. Torah tziva lanu Moshe. Moshe had both. Moshe was the leader as far as Torah. Moshe was the leader as far as Eved. And that's what God means. You spoke against both. You spoke against my Eved. You spoke against Moshe. Both would have been completely wrong. Both need to be condemned. That is exactly um, how connecting it to the story in the Gemara, how they explain it. Just to end with a very interesting story that Rabbi Bernstein brings down. It was one time, you know, Bechat Levana could be said up till, and we still, I think, have one more night if you didn't say it yet. You're supposed to only say it till the 15th of the month, um, more or less. Anyways, it was a very cloudy month, and the Hasidim, following some opinion somewhere, maybe it's a Zohar, they, saw, they decided they're going to say it on the 16th, the night after the due date. And in general, the Hasidim um, don't really have a problem, you know, doing mitzvot past their allotted times. You look at, uh, as an example, the Zman Tefila, the, the latest time to pray. You look at the Kor Shulchan Aruch, the Gemara, Mishnayot, everything. It's three, four hours, depending, right? And the Chasidim, they have no problem delaying it five, six, seven hours. There's no times because they, again, part of preparation for prayer is also praying. And uh, if, I'm, if I'm preparing, it's okay. You know, I don't know exactly all the reasons. I'm sure someone else can enlighten you, enlighten you better. But in general, the Hasidim sometimes um, give less priority to the exact timing of mitzvot. So they said Bechat Levana a day later on the 16th. Anyways, there was a big rabbi, who, who, the author of Ktsot HaChoshen. He heard about this and he excommunicated them. He put them in Cherem, which was no small thing back then. The, um, the students realized they're excommunicated from the town. They decided to go to the Jose of Lublin. They decided to go to the great Jose, who was a Hasidic rabbi. They thought over there they'll have company. Well, when the Jose found out that they're coming, he sent them a letter. He said, don't come until the month of excommunication is over. They couldn't believe it. You know, it's one thing that the Ktsot is going to go against us. But you're our rabbi. You're the Hasidic Rebbe. You also can't appreciate what we did. He says, don't come until the month is over. Well, after the month they came and they demanded an explanation from the rabbi, the, uh, the, the Jose of Lublin said, listen, you know, you think I'm Hasidish, so therefore I'm going to uh, uh, invite you in. And it's true, maybe, maybe that's where we excel in Avodah. But when it comes to matters of Torah, without a shadow of a doubt, the Ktsot HaChoshen is the leading figure, the leading authority person. And if he put you in Cherem, I cannot go against that. So anyways... This is, um, this is uh, amazing insights and thoughts on um, the, the lesson, I believe, is how we have to try to be like Moshe, try to be Avdi, try to be Moshe, to work on our prayer, to work on our learning. 
and either one alone is incomplete. To make sure that we are doing, like all of the rabbis, by the way, all the rabbis had both. They were just arguing on, you know, they were worried about if you emphasize one over the other, people may neglect the other one at that expense. But for us, we have to be like Avdi. We have to work on our relationship with Hashem through Torah, through prayer, like Moshe, Torah, and uh, prayer through Avdi. We should be Zocheh to uh, accomplish all of these uh, beautiful, beautiful levels and heights. We'll stop over here. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye-bye.